Hi, welcome to Gino Jobert, How to Change the World, Part 2. Um, yesterday, I uploaded a video that some of you have already seen, which goes into great detail and length of, um, you know, in order to make a difference in this world, it all begins with self. We have to take accountability of our own actions. Um, and, you know, I covered a, a plethora of different topics uh, to show the difference between conscious and subconscious, um, the 12 bloodline ruling families. And I also mentioned that I would discuss the difference between the music business and the music industry. I will get into that in this segment. Um, but first, I want to also elaborate um, on some of the points of part one. The first thing is, is the reason why I mentioned, you know, when you go into introspection and you work on um, giving yourself valuable time that belongs to you, um, then you, you have to eliminate the distractions and the TVs and the phones and the computers. The reason why I said that is because watch how this ties together. The 12 ruling bloodline families control so much of the information that we're able to receive. So in other words, if there are hidden truths out there, they're hidden very deeply and you don't stumble upon them easily. I can attest to that through an ardent search over the span since 1992. Um, so it, it if you think about it, if your mind is so powerful, but you've been led to believe differently by TV, news programs, um, teaching, um, why is that? Because there's a war going on for your mind and people want to control that mind. But the most liberating and most satisfy satisfying experience that you can have is when you realize, wow, my mind is not for rent to like an old rush song to any God of government. But some people say, wait a minute. Now here are the Christians in the back saying, well, you know, he must be an atheist. Well, why do we have to give labels to everything? Where did that start? Is it a good or a bad thing? I'll let you be the judge. I'm not here to tell anybody what to think. The TV already does that for you. I'm here to show people how to think. You know, another thing is, is people, when they find um, stars, characters with great charismatic features, they, they begin to want to follow them. And you know what? Jesus was no exception. People followed him. Buddha, Muhammad. I mean, the list goes on. Gandhi. Um, why, why did people follow these um uh, archetypes, these people who in some circles is defined as reaching Christ-like consciousness. The reason why people follow them is because they want what these archetypes have. And what these archetypes have is a level of maturation, understanding, peace, bliss, enlightenment. All those are on a visual spectrum that, that run anywhere from 700 hertz to higher. Now, you ever remember hearing things like uh, maybe in your childhood, like sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt. Wow, how untrue of a statement could that be? Words have power. In fact, so much power that Every word can be measured, just like every emotion. And, and when I say measured, I mean there's a frequency attached to every thought, to every word, and to everything that's in existence. And so if, if you want to follow the archetypes, that's your choice. The beautiful thing about life is there's something called free will. And something I mentioned in, in part one, or as would say the, the starting video of this series, is that we, we have a choice we, uh, in the decisions that we make, what we consume, what we do. And a lot of times people do not understand why they do certain things. So I covered 
the topics between the conscious mind and the subconscious mind. Now, the reason why people follow these archetypes is they want what those archetypes have. And, and so rather than doing the same things that those archetypes did, which was to go within, and it's called self-discovery, um, and purge out all the things that don't that you don't want there anymore. It could be bad lessons. It could be bad instruction. It could be things that um, hold you down or hold you back from progressing and at the same time experiencing bliss. So this is why I, I want to provide this series. I realized, you know, what good is it to have a light into the world? But to go hide that light underneath the bed. What good is it to have spent all these years of researching? What if I could save you, the viewer, thousands and thousands of hours of searching time and provide you with enough golden nuggets and keys to where you could be on an expedited journey to inner peace, happiness, bliss? enlightenment um then i think i would be doing my service to humanity so once i i took control of my own actions once i took control of self-accountability i began to experience a new way of living for example i used to get so mad road rage when someone would cut me off and um, if, if we had to use a color spectrum to show just how mad I got, I wasn't red hot, I was white hot. But as I began this journey in evolution and raising that vibe, um, that didn't happen anymore. Now, do I still get a slight twinge? Yes. But look at it like this. So a clock has a pendulum. That pendulum can swing so far back. And that pendulum can swing so far forward. When you raise your vibe, the furthest back point is not the same as where you started. So what happens is, now you can't get as mad because you've raised your vibration. Now, instead of talking about the wonderful beautitudes that the Messiah spoke of or Buddha, because, you know, a lot of the things that I've found is that no matter what religion or spiritual sector you search, whether it be the Nag Hammadi, whether it be the Bible, whether you go to the parts of the Bible that were omitted by King James and start with the Ethiopian Bible, or wherever you go, there's a similitude in all those different esoteric texts. And the similitude is for example, you reap what you sow. In the spiritual sector, they say karma, right? It's the same thing, just using a variation of words, but with the same meaning, same intent. So when you look at all the devices, the reason why I said turn off the TV is because if you notice how many programs, and it is called television programming for a reason, because it's there to program your mind. But those programs are designed because there's only a few people that own all that stuff. We, and it all leads back to the 12 bloodline families that, that run the world. Even though I mentioned three names, there's there's uh, nine other names that I didn't mention. But if you do your research, you'll find out, you know, names like DuPont, Windsor, Rockefeller, Rothschild. You, you know, you will start to uncover some of the things that, that I have found. Let's think about this. So you, you remember um, ever hearing about something called the Salem Witch Trials? Okay, well, why am I bringing that up? Well, if magic didn't exist, why would they have been burnt at the stake? Now, we are so easily led to form an opinion and to join a side. And we live in a world of duopoly, okay? Um, Coke, Pepsi, up, down, hot, cold, okay? 
But in the, in the spectrum, from one end to the next, there's a 180 degree difference, okay, between both extremes. So what happens is, is if once you begin to pull back the curtain, another case in point, so you may have heard the term apocalypse. So if, if you go to ask, because I love using this reference point, is if you go ask 10 people or 100 people what the word apocalypse means, the majority are going to say something along the lines of like the end of the world, doom and gloom, you know, catastrophic event. OK. And so if, if 10 of those people that you asked, if eight or nine of them said, you know, it's doom and gloom, it's the end of the world, all that. Does that mean they are right? Because, see, this is how conditioning, cultural conditioning works. And this is, you know, the school systems, the education system has been in, infiltrated. Because you see, these 12 bloodline families, they know to have total dominion and control. They have to corner every market. From the food you eat, to the air you breathe, to the water you drink, to the information you are allowed to receive. That's why for thousands of years we've had secret societies, which... Only those who were in the power, they would continue to feed that information to only a select few initiatives. So instead of me focusing in on the problem, I just want to let you know that I have gone very deep in my studies and sometimes to the point of what I call the tipping point. I could not consume one more word, one more bit of information on some days because I had just I had taken up as much as I could on that particular day. And so I, I get a lot of questions. People say, well, how do you know, since there's so much disinformation out there, what is true versus what isn't? When you begin to raise your vibration, because, you know, back to school, just to show another point. We were taught about a guy by the name of Edison dealing with electricity. But actually, we should have been taught about Nikola Tesla. Tesla's, one of his most famous quotes was, when you look at the universe in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration, you will never see it the same. Now, watch why this is a golden key. If words have a certain frequency to it, then we take etymology. Because remember, I mentioned that word apocalypse. When, when you look at the word apocalypse and you go back to its Greek origin, the word simply means to unveil, uncover. No difference. I'll give you a couple of another example. So people say, oh, we need this president to be impeached. You go ask eight or ten people. Um, what does that mean? Oh, he's going to get fired. No, impeached simply means to question. When you look at etymology, the origin of words you begin to discover a whole plethora of new understanding. And what that understanding will, will do is it, it'll make most people mad in the beginning. But then you have to get past that phase. There's so many different levels of awareness. Okay. So when people say I'm awoke and I'm awake and, and all that, that's no different than saying you went to school. Well, some people went to school, but they dropped out in third grade. Some people went to 12th grade. Some did a lifelong study of just consuming, like I did, as much information as possible. But then when you begin to raise your vibration and you begin to experience bliss, guess what happens? Your sixth sense, which the TV and all that negativity and fear lowers your ability of your sixth sense. It's like... A bodybuilder, he goes and he works out all the time. Well, he stops going to the gym for two weeks. Well, he's not as strong as he once was. When you're operating on all cylinders and you're firing away and you're just, you're living your best life because you're making a conscious decision to, your sixth sense begins to develop and strengthen. It's a muscle like everything else. And when you strengthen that, it will tell you because energy doesn't lie. That's why they have charlatans in the world. 
And they can fool thousands of people. But there's always a couple of people they can't fool. And to the charlatan, he thinks, how can I fool everybody? Because the ones he cannot or she cannot fool are those who have elevated their sense of knowing through self-growth, through maturation, and developing those skills that we were tricked into uh, forgetting how powerful we really are. That's why things on TV and the radio, it's such a negative message because when, when you vibrate on a low frequency, you lose that sixth sense. And so how, how much self-loathing do you experience when you allow someone closer to your heart into your life? And they deceive you. You're like, wow, you start questioning your own judgment abilities. You, you self-loathe. You're spiraling into that whole negative soup like gumbo. Gumbo's great when you have the right ingredients and the right amount of ingredients. The same thing is with self-growth. You will realize there are certain things that if you don't get rid of, whether it's a way of thinking, a way of communicating, a way of interacting with others, you, you're only going to get so hard. So what I would like to do now, um, to, now that you see how this has been a case study in my own personal life, one thing I want you, the viewer, to always remember, there are 12 universal laws. And for those who have a keen observation, you're going to slowly notice that I incorporate little bits of information that you're going to start seeing certain patterns, just like I did as I began to discover these bits of information. That was hidden for a long time. Um, and, and so when you look at uh, the 12 universal laws, one of them is called free will. And this is why I said in the in the previous video that um, I don't like to be controlled because, you know, if you have an unalienable right for freedom and someone tricks you into giving up that freedom, who's at blame? Them, you, or both of y'all? I'll let you decide. But free will is a beautiful thing. Supposedly, it's not just contained to earth. This so based on the information I've uncovered, um, is is a everything that's out there. Free will is is a part of is a universal law. So the power hungry people like to take away your free will, and it's all done through deceptive means. And you can either allow it and be complicit and and follow in whatever they're telling you to do. Or you can stand up for what you believe is right. Because if you don't stand up for something, you'll pretty much fall for anything. Now, I said I would cover the different aspects of the music business and music industry. Because a lot of people are going to come to my page and channel based on this being a music platform. However, I have more to offer than just music. And... You know, you think about it in life. How often have we been approached by someone and one of the first questions they ask you is, well, what do you do for a living? Most people give one answer. And don't even realize why they question in most cases, not all, but in most cases it's being posed because the person asking the question wants to put you in their own perspective where they want to put you in a certain place, either above them or below them. And it's sad. It really is because, you know, we some of us have four, five, six different talents and exceptional at those talents. Some of us only have one. So what? It's not for me to judge because I'm more blessed or less blessed than someone else. I shared three secret keys yesterday. Gratitude, 
forgiveness, and love. In, in Louisiana, we have a culture in cooking called Cajun cooking. And there's a term coined for the Trinity. Now, you can ask some people, and they will tell you the Trinity consists of uh, bell pepper, garlic, and onion. You ask some other people, they'll tell you it's celery, garlic, and onion. So, it's not that either one is right or wrong, because, see, that's linear thinking. When you start thinking spatially versus linear, you find out that there are a lot of things that don't always have to be black and white. For example, seeing is believing, right? How many times have we said that? Well, on the visual spectrum, humans can only see a very small amount of the visual spectrum. Let's just say that spectrum really consists of way bigger than where my hands are spaced apart now. Okay? So, if seeing is believing... And there is more in existence outside of our visual spectrum. How much do you miss out in understanding and comprehension just from that alone? So, one of the things that, that, that I really love about life is when I started to incorporate my, what I've consists of uh, the Trinity. And for someone else, it may be something else. And guess what? They may be right too. Doesn't mean I'm right, you're wrong. That's linear thinking. That's putting you in a box. That's making you puny. We've been going down that road for the last thousands of years. That road is broken. I don't want to fix that road anymore. I'm working towards creating a real solution. So if more people can wake up to the fact that they are not this small, and if more people could wake up to the fact that we have an amazing amount of ability, and just like anything, the more you practice becoming a better you, the better you feel about life, the better you're going to treat those around you. So I, I, I want to share why I'm saying this right now. I had a most pleasant experience in November of 2021. I went and did a project in Edinburgh, Indiana. And there were so many valuable lessons that I learned personally. And if I share these with you, you're going to probably say, oh, wow, that hit home. That really hit home. Because even though this has been a work in progression my whole life, let's just say I had a level 100 self-doubt at the age of 8, 9, 10, 16, 20. And let's just say by the time I hit 52, um, I had a self-doubt of maybe 10, 15. When I went to Indiana, I brought my self-doubt down to a zero. So this was an epiphany for me. So what happened was I walked into a room. I was there to feed Afghani refugees. And there was about approximately 200 people that worked to serve or cook or clean or do maintenance for this project at Camp uh, Atterbury. Now, when I walked into the room, we had two different groups of people. We had the workers, we had the refugees. Now, the energy in the room was very low, abysmal, heavy. From the worker standpoint, that was attributed to these factors based on my observation. There was a watchdog group called KBR. KBR's responsibility was to make sure that all workers performed everything on a level that was serve safe certified to where, you know, there's no risk of food poisoning or anything that could hurt this experience for the refugees. So they were very stern, austere, um, matter of fact, 
showed no love. It was just they're doing their job and that's the way that they came across. You mess up, you do this wrong, you're getting fired, you're out of here. Well, to all the workers, a lot of them got an instant increase in pay taking on this project. So they didn't want to leave. So they worked in fear. Then you have, on the other hand, the refugees. The refugees are coming through the line, head down low, scared. Well, first of all, they've just been displaced. They've lost just about everything they have. So three days time, I said to myself, I said, you know what? This is, this is just not going to work. Something has to happen. Either I'm going to change the energy in this room or I have to leave. Leave the good money and all. So I'm going to say this was divine. Something led me to A, pose the question. Am I going to be able to sustain this or do I need to move on? Or am I going to make a change? So I began with one simple act. This is how powerful we are as people. And we were all conditioned to believe otherwise. Through the TV, through the radio, through the schooling, through our parents that if they were negative, through our friends if they were negative, through our enemies if they were negative. So I began with one simple thing. We had to wear a mask. So, imagine this is my mask. You can still see I'm smiling, right? Right. So, what I did was I began to smile. Slowly but surely. And when I say slowly, I mean in, in a matter of a couple of days. Other people began to smile. I said, okay. That's one victory. Now, let me take it a step further. So I began to sing. That began to evoke more smiles on more people. Then I began to interact with everyone. And I did it with this disposition, with this energetic field, with this intent to just be loved. I don't want anything from anybody else except to see the mirror. So if that bounces back, Wow. Well, guess what happened? I didn't go home. I stayed on the project. And the whole room transformed. Transformed to, uh, instead of rigid, instead of low vibing, people started to make connections. Somewhere along the line, it started to hit home with anyone I interacted with. And I interacted with just about everybody. Something hit home with the KBR. They began to pull back the reins, not be as austere. <clears throat> it's almost as if they realized, oh, wow, we can still do our job and have empathy and compassion. With the refugees, it was like, oh, um, Hey, some of these people are right. Well, this is how powerful we are. If one person could change. Because for years I used to think just the opposite. There's no way one person could make a huge difference in the world. Don't doubt. So the evolution, the end product, whether you're a carpenter or any other trade, when you begin to create something out of next to nothing, and then you're finished and it's a beautiful creation. You're just like the image of God. Oh, that's right. We were made in his image. So there's that sense of appreciation, gratitude. But when I saw the ripple of that, each person as it began to affect those around them. If there were people that worked real close to me, then there were those that saw me intermittently. And then there were those who saw me very infrequently based on, you know, what was going on at, during that given time. It, it, it got so amazing 
by the time that I left, that the refugees would come into the cafeteria, or if we want to be politically correct, because it was an army installation, the mess hall, they started waving as soon as they came in the door, right at me and those working right around me, because I transformed them as well. They began to lighten up. They began to say, oh, wow, we could, we, we could actually give off a good energy and it's not going to get us far. I was the test, I was the test dummy. Okay, but guess what? I didn't mind putting my head on a chop, chopping block. Visionaries take the first step. Early adopters take the next step. And then once you get past the early adopters, now you have a huge tsunami effect. But I'm not done because the story gets even better. There were so many kids that I adopted in my heart. They had family. Some of them did. But the ones that did. I adopted in my heart. And I, and I treated them. I have no kids of my own. But I treated them like they were my own. Like just love, nurture. I gave them nicknames. I even gave one guy a nickname. That I swear if you looked at him. You'd say well. I don't know what Jesus really looked like. But he. That would be the guy you'd point him. We'd all point him out and say that that's Jesus, right? So I called him Jesus. The, the workers immediately around me, you could tell them tense up free. It's like, oh, that might not go well because most of them are Muslim. Guess what Jesus did? He turned around and he goes like that. And then the workers immediately exhale. Oh, okay, wow, that ain't so bad, right? But the little kid, Hamza, give me one second. I will be right back. I have to show you this because this was given to me by Hamza. It was still in the plastic, brand new. This may have a value at a store. One, two, three, five dollars, whatever. So the average person could look at this and say, oh, that ain't worth nothing. To me, it's worth everything. And I'll tell you why. When you've got a kid that comes up, has Holly next to nothing because he's just been exiled from his country, starting over with so much uncertainty, not knowing what's going to happen next, etc. And he gives you something that's no different than a person who has one dollar in their pocket and they give it to you. I was blown away. In fact, I was so blown away at the offer alone that I told Hazam, I used to call him Mustache. I'd say, Mustache, Mustache, no, I can't take your motorbike, man. Here, th th this is your motorbike. He's like, no, you take, you take, you take. A voice told me, do not. Deny that kid the power of gifting. I took. I blessed that boy. I took. I stopped what I was doing and blessing. I poured upon that kid's head between me and him. But this is the profundity, the effect of kindness, of love. Of gratitude, appreciation, happiness. You cannot fake that. You can. You can try. You can fake yourself. You. How many people lie to themselves? Okay. I was one. I did it for years. I was miserable. Stop lying to yourself. Be honest. But this, that kid will never be forgotten because it showed me, wow, it's a beautiful thing when you give. I didn't have to be nice to these people. All I had to do was serve them food. I didn't have to love these people. All I had to do was serve them food the right way to where 
Nobody got sick or hurt. And in an expedient fashion, that was my job requirement. But it showed me at the end of this experience, I knew, I said, wow. My self-doubt went from a 10 out of 100 to a zero. Because I realized this is the effect that one person could make. And not just one, but thousands of people. So I came home, back to Louisiana, and I recorded time for a change. And it made me a better person. And if I can be a better person tomorrow than today, I've won. I, I have the most rich life. And I'm going to leave on this segment here. Um, th there was a kid one time. Her and her family were in the village. And this is back in the early 1900s. And of course, the barons of the town were out and about throughout the village. And, you know, of course, you could tell they were just super wealthy, right? And so the, the mother had made a comment about this wealthy family. And she says, oh, my God, they're so rich. And the little girl of that mother looked up and said, Mom, they are not rich. The only thing they have is money. I would like to leave you on that note. Because currency or money is the currency, money is the currency of control, but love is the currency of abundance. So if you want to change the world, it all starts here. You have to change you first. And when you do, you're going to live a life for all intent and purposes. You probably never thought possible because you're so used to that old lifestyle before you begin to chip away and remove all the barnacles, the crustaceans that have been affixed to you through time, through somebody else's ideas and somebody else's belief system. Thank you very much. And if you would, I would love for anyone who is impacted by this video or who you may even be in a higher plane of existence than myself. I applaud you. This is not a competition. This is a journey that we all must take call life. But share your experiences to how you can remember your old you and your new you. And you're so proud of the steps that you took. The law of action is one of the 12 universal laws. So it takes action. To make these changes. to For you to become a better person. For you to then have a better life. Uh, but but share, share in, in the comment section. And if you look in the description field below. Please subscribe, like, and hit the bell to my channel. So you will also be kept up. As I continue to share. Um, not only my discoveries. But um, we, we may even go live in the very near future. Once I complete this segment and series. Um, but, but at the end of the day, unity is about coming together. And let me tell you what, I, I left this out. I, I have to include it. The 200 workers that were working there together, there were people from Haiti. There were people from the islands like Jamaica. There were people from all over the United States. There were people from... Uh, Europe, all over the globe, was working on this project. And guess what? We were the number one defects in all of America. We had the best scores on everything. So guess what? Stop believing the TV. Because with unity, when we all work together to the same goal and the same cause, guess what? There's nothing can stop you. Nothing. Thank you very much. I'm Gino Jobert. Have a great day.